Welcome to another segment of Market Overdrive. I am your host, residential real estate broker, Carla Mina. And with me, I've missed him so much, mm -hmm. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mamedi. I missed you like a heart attack. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. How you been? Great, great. How's life? We it's don't care. It's been a while since we did a show together, huh? It's been a while. How long? I don't care. Two or three weeks? <laughs> <laughs> it's been the best three weeks of my life. Can you please get to our amazing guest? Because I find him in every we event. A, we he got did, a lot of amazing um, guests The here CHA today. Uh, 2018 Owner Symposium with me. Mr. Mario Correa. How are you, Mario? Hey, how are you doing, Carla? Doing Please? outstanding. It's so great to see you in the studio. Oh, it's fun to be here. It's do, been a while. Do we get to call Mario a guest? I mean, he's been on the show probably more than Graco. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He does hang you out. Know, Graco's an official host. Mario's like an honorary <laughs> guest like at least once every 45 days. I think Mario should make it a habit to come and visit and hang out with Market hey, Overdrive you know, instead of that other program we're not going to talk about that you do. You oh, want to be a guest, right. though, you could be called a guest. Oh, I'm just hey, going to call you one of the other hosts. It's all hosts. good. I'm part it's of the family. Good. Yeah, of course. So um, I just want to share that we did do a, uh, a seminar at the symposium, and Mario killed it. Everybody was so in love with him because, as you know, real estate is um, what everybody's kind of trying to do in 2018 and now into tw as we're getting into 2019. So, Mario, thank you so much for making time to come to our show. Listen, it was a blast. It was a blast at the symposium. They asked a lot of good questions, so we got a lot of information out there. Well, let's share the love with our audience, and why don't we start with just giving us a little bit about you and also telling us, you know, what is estate planning? Okay, well, I'm an estate and trust attorney, and basically estate planning is arranging ownership of assets to maximize how much your loved ones get while minimizing their stress. So people normally think of it like wills and trusts. Hmm. And how is that relevant to real estate? Well, you know, what I find is most of the wealth is held in real estate. So when we're looking at somebody's balance sheets, a lot of the clients that I deal with, the, the majority of their wealth is caught up in a house and some secondary third, third, third uh, investment properties. It makes it for transacting really easier, like easier when you do have a trust in place because I got into situations where families don't have a trust in place or don't have the instructions of how to proceed after one, uh, a loved one is gone. Yeah, and it gets kind of complicated because people aren't thinking about death when you're buying stuff or disability, you know, and that's where the kind of the, I see it in my practice because we also do estate and trust litigation. So we see when things kind of blow up and when the ownership wasn't the way people thought it was. I mean, it, gets, it does get really complicated. So who would you advise to reach out to you, or who does this relate to, actually? You know, it, it really does relate to a lot of real estate owners because there's so much wealth that's caught up in real estate, especially as you get older, you're paying off that that property. And in Chicago, any property, as you well know, could be two, three, five hundred, north of a million dollars, you know? And then the other people that it affects that people don't think about mm -hmm. is the elderly because the elderly have exposure to going to a nursing home or getting government benefits. And when they do, they put a Medicaid lien on that property and that also affects the next generation. I mean, I could go on and on, you know, if there's a disabled family member, a business owner, somebody with minor children, if there's a benefic a second marriage is a really common one. Or I come across a situation quite a bit where people like have significant others, but they're not married and they are assuming certain things are going to unravel. Well, somebody, a little birdie told me that someone in the studio is buying a new car, so can you make it to that person and leave it to me in case something happens to him? Absolutely. We can create structures, however. Can I get I see Nick's car? eyes shifting <clears throat> left to right. No. That would be Can I be your beneficiary, mm -hmm. Nick? <laughs> yeah, I got something to give you, leave, leave behind for you. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get it. Mario, we'll take care of that after the show. <laughs> All right, we got Mario, it. thank you for sharing. Listen, where can we get a hold of you? Well, give me a call at my office at 773-489-8500. And it does get a lot more complicated than we can discuss here in a few minutes on, on the air. So give me a call for a free consultation at 773-489-8500. And that's at Correa Law, C-O-R-R-E-A Law. Dot com. Love it. Thank you for coming on. We got him on for a few more minutes, I'm assuming, right? Uh-uh. So you got to get with the program. That's Are you going to introduce our other host? Hi, Let's Graco. Go. Hey, guys. Graco. How's it going? Well, you guys were supposed to talk amongst yourself while we oh. did the switch, but <laughs> it's <laughs> been a while. Supposed? Welcome so, back, Nick Mamedi. Nick, how's, uh, how's the market? <laughs> uh, well, there's no secret. Last time we did a show, I think it was about a week after, or a few days after they announced a Fed rate increase. So that's usually... Um, Bad news publicly, I think people get like, you know, they hear rate increase and they feel like the rates go from 4% to like 8% and the 30-year fix is out of whack and now they can't buy the house. But there was a slight bump in rates. And typically, that does freak buyers, potential home buyers out a little bit. But at the end of the day, it is also heading into the fourth quarter, which generally is a slower season, as you know, just as much as I know. Uh, in the industry. So I think the compound effect of the rates going up a little bit and heading into the fourth quarter, it feels a little stagnant at this moment, but I wouldn't worry about it because um, 
you know, like we've said in other shows, rates go up, or when there's a Fed announcement of interest rates going up, it was usually baked into those rates already, well before the actual announcement. So it, it uh, the announcement might have put people on pause, but the rates have already been uh, up to those parameters for, I'd say, about 30 days before the rate announcement actually happened. So you might even see the rates slightly lower since the announcement, um, hypothetically So speaking. do you think we're seeing a correction or adjustment in the market <clears throat> at this time? No, um... I think that, you know, the pace that we were on for the last several years is hard to sustain because wages don't go up as fast as the appreciation levels were going up in some of the areas, specifically some areas in Chicago. As you know, you know, there was a point when you could buy a condo in certain parts of a city like Chicago and it went up 10 percent one year, 12 percent another year, 15 percent another year. At some point, that's going to have to stop going up at that rapid pace and go back to what is probably more like a 3 percent appreciation annually or 6 percent. Um, but I don't think that <clears> – <throat> I think maybe because in the high, in, on the heels of uh, the worst market crash we've ever seen, when we say correction, I think everybody starts to think of that kind of correction. No, I don't necessarily um, think it's a correction. I want to call it like an adjustment. Like a- I think that anything that's going that fast needs to eventually slow down. It doesn't mean it won't still improve or, right. or gain appreciation, but I think that you can't expect properties to keep going up that fast in price when wages aren't going up that fast. As well, I completely agree, and I think one of the things that kind of s- not stagnated the market but ca- made it slow down a bit was the increase in property taxes, right? And so, with well, the pro- increase in property taxes and the increase in the interest rate, it made some of those cl- uh, buyers who had a really s- sensitive or you know, everybody buys based on monthly payments. So, as soon as you get above $50 or $100 above that payment, you can no longer qualify. So, that took a lot of people out of the market. But listen, this is fourth quarter, so there is. Um, an opportunity here for you to buy. And I encourage all those investors who are looking to buy and flip next year um, to stay open-minded about the market and the areas that they're focusing because there's going to be inventory and availability of inventory and lack of um, competition. So you can acquire the asset now, rehab it, and bring it in first quarter or spring market, which is the best time to come back. So anyway, since we've already wrapped up our market trends, um, obviously you know that Nick and I both are in the trenches. Um, so if you have any informa- or any questions about the information we share here, please reach out to us directly, and you can uh, reach me at, you know, Carla at marketoverdrive.com. Um, let me go ahead, and Graco, do you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, let's get it going. We're running a little behind. Uh, today in studio, we have Tony DeSano with Parkview Realty. Tony, welcome to Market Overdrive. I know you have a Thank guest you. with you, but we're going to start with you yeah, first, sure. so tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been in the industry. Wow. I'm, thank you for having me. I really hey, Tony. Hi. How are you? Whoa, Car- okay, Tony, you have to talk into the microphone. Carla, you need to walk away from the microphone. <laughs> Big difference. I've been, I've been a realtor since 2003. Started investing in the early 2000s, got into the lending business, and um, kind of settled into this foreclosure default type of real estate realtor role, okay. uh, which I've been doing for the last um, eight years. Um, I remember Tony from the lending back. Yeah. Well, I think first time we met was back in 2001 or two or something yeah. like that. He was representing he was that doing, Wrigley Mansion, Nick. He was doing um, he did rehab, rehab loans. loans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, uh, yeah short-term uh, loans for investors. At Rothschild or something like that? Smith Rothschild. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. you invite. I was in your office. Yeah. You were in his closet. In his closet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, that you're you're one of the lucky few. You know, you know, <laughs> you're one of the lucky few to get into my clo- what? my closet. Right? <laughs> Can you we know? get on with the real information? I'm just saying, Tony. <laughs> Tony's not. His resume is real. He's been doing it for well over 18 years because I remember meeting him in 01 the first yeah. time. You yeah. know. Yeah. So it's been a while. So yeah, I've been focusing a lot on REO, which is foreclosure listings mm-hmm. for banks and private investors and equity funds. Um, and then more recently, I've been working with uh, Zoom.com, which is a it's a uh, marketplace platform that allows a, re- uh, a retail seller to sell in an auction. Um, really? Yeah. So it's yeah, so a different concept. That's it's pretty sure. interesting uh, that you do yeah. bring that to the market, right? Because as a practicing realtor, I can only see where, you know, usually the buyer comes in, we give them a consultation, we advise them, they tell us where they want to shop, and then we go and introduce them to all the properties that are available. But when somebody places a property on the market, they are they charge the listing agent charges a marketing fee per se, correct? Right. And that marketing fee covers the payment of the cooperating agent. So if I'm bringing you a buyer, the listing agent is paying me a marketing fee or a co-op fee. Correct. With Zoom, can you explain the dynamics and how this works? Yeah, so basically what we're doing is we're entering your property for sale through this online marketplace, which is essentially an auction. And we're asking the buyer to pay a premium to purchase the property. What? 
What? Yeah. So you know, why it's like New York? You? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, screw it. We look at it this way too. You know, your your real estate asset is one of the most valuable assets that most people own, and you know, art, jewelry, high end cars most expensive items in the world are sold through auction. So why shouldn't you sell your real estate through auction? And all those auctions, the buyer pays a premium. So that's the idea, you know. Well, I mean, I get it, right? Because when you're representing distress sales or foreclosures, you usually see that type of True. system being used. But in the conventional general marketplace, a uh, conventional seller is not used to doing that and a conventional buyer is not used to. And they also associate it with the distress sales. So how do you plan on? That, that's a challenge. So it's education. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a distressed, foreclosed property that you're getting at a discount. Okay. So we're selling at retail <coughs> value, and um, there we have we have uh, stats that show that it's it's working. So it's really it's it's interesting. Yeah, okay. unique properties are oftentimes put on auctions as well. Yeah. Uh, what? Are you unique? unique properties, luxury homes. It's not just distressed stuff that goes right. Auction. Correct. But if you're going to put the listing on this system, right, per se, and it's a conventional deal, and I have uh, a unique property or a mansion or maybe a 1.2 to 3.5 million dollar home. Right. And then typically when you're using the system, we always say, well, you're going to get it at a discount because, you know, it's that's the perception. So you're going to absorb you're willing to pay additional fees that you would normally not have to pay in a conventional deal. But since you're going to get it at discount, then I would totally absorb that cost. But now you're saying it's a conventional seller. So I don't want right. to sell my property at a discount. Right. Well, and, and you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's you know, you think of it this way, too. You, you also don't have to pay a commission to a realtor on the seller side. So maybe you are willing, no, the buyer pays, but you're willing to maybe take a little bit less. Not so much of a huge discount. I want to hear from Larry. Larry White of Zoom. Yeah. Give me the full yeah, spectrum. So he's, 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 like, he's, he's like, 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 he's I told but you I was going to play devil's say. advocate, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to be no. Nick today. The, exactly what you're saying is the problems that we combat at Zoom every single day. But this is where, like, I come from a deep real estate background. Like, I've done 60 deals plus a year myself as an individual agent. My teams did 320 plus deals. Then I built a brokerage of over 3,000 deals. So, like, I have a lot of experience on the real estate space. So where I came in with Zoom is to help teach, educate their agents how to take this to a residential platform. Because as Carla mentioned, most of the time, REOs, like auction and REOs kind of go hand in hand. Right. That's the perception. Right. But this is what I teach agents to do, right? If the seller is not paying the commission, we can now reduce the price of the listing by the commission amount and the seller will net the same amount of money. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, let me ask you, where do, who is finding the, the properties now? The, the real estate agent or the buyers? Who's finding them? Yeah, who's, who finds them? put the them on the market originally? I would say the buyers, sometimes they go I mean, online. It's, it's definitely yeah. moving, yeah. The buyers are definitely, <laughs> well, hold on a second. I know where you're going with that. I mean, you know, you, with places like, well, there's three or four big platforms that every Absolutely. consumer now knows to go to, even though the information might be a little delayed or off or whatever. They can still search. Yeah. So um, usually, the technical way to answer is the agents are finding the property, but I, consumers are able to kind of sniff them out. And like I'm being realistic here, right? Like because yeah. I like I'm licensed and brokered in three states. Right. When I started, I used to go to Tony and say, "Tony, I found you the perfect four bedroom, three bath house, all of the cr criteria you met." Now Tony's coming to me and saying, "Hey, Larry, I found the perfect four bedroom, three bath house. Where can I find it?" Now, let me ask you this. If the seller is not paying the commission and we've reduced the price, let's say market value is 300, mm -hmm. you have two homes in that neighborhood, one that's on the regular MLS at 300, one is on the MLS for 285, which one does the buyer want to see first? Yeah. And this is where we drive the exposure to the consumer. At the end of the day, the buyer and seller are essentially going to net the same, but from a marketing standpoint, we're driving a lot of traffic and exposure. And if we can get more exposure at that 285 and get people into that bidding frenzy, that's where we end up netting the seller more amount, more money. And like we're just expanding this more and more on the residential side, which is super fun. So for those that are watching the show and are kind of are very intrigued about considering buying via auction instead of traditional, tell us a little bit about how you have to be ready when it comes to funding and financing because things aren't as easy 
when you're going to an auction, you have to have all your ducks in a row. Make so, sure you're really able to finance property. So this was a big point for me. When, when Zome and I were kind of sitting at the negotiating table, I, I sat down and I had this wish list. One, and I'm going to throw this in there because it pisses my bosses off over there. We is, like pissing bosses all right, off here. All right. <laughs> Welcome so, to the Piss Boss Off Show. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I get, I get to make up my own title. And they're like, okay, fine. And so I was like, when they gave that to me, I was like, damn, what do I want to be when I grow up? So I was like, all right, catalyst and creator of opportunities. So that, that was the first point. And then the, everything else was actually more serious about real estate. It had to emulate the traditional model. So essentially, Zoom is an offer marketplace, an offer management platform. And when somebody submits an offer, they're going to get their diligence period, contingencies. Because of the way that we position it, we take the highest offer, we add 5%, and we put the final contract together for a total purchase price of $300,000. The lender sees that, finances is the three hundred. dollars So this is where we've made this specifically for the retail market, where the sellers, they don't have a credit card, they don't have to have $5,000 earnest money as you go to the courthouse. It literally looks very similar to the, any other traditional model. Are we able to roll that in to the financing? Yeah, because when you actually get the contract, it says what it says as far as the purchase price. Oh. So they, they, they're kind of we've sold they're reverse in- engineering the price, essentially, like mm-hmm. going the traditional way that we've always been used to. Yeah. An agent comes out and says, well, we have to sell it for X much for you to net X because you have to pay this person, this person, and that person. They're basically saying we have to sell it for X, then we have to add this much on top to pay these people off. Does that sound, am I, am I yeah. explaining it right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it's reverse engineered, but at the end of the day, the same result gets to the lender on a contract, and then we're just like, what's the cost of the house? This is it? Here we go. And the buyers in most cases, like, they're willing to pay a certain amount for that property. Right. Now, on the bidding platform, it's all transparent, right? And I argue back and forth with agents all the time when they give out highest and best. Lots of times, there's not a lot of trust in the real estate industry. People are like, well, are there really multiple offers this? This platform, everybody can see what's going on there, yeah. and and buyers are like, well, I don't want to lose that home over six dollars a month on my mortgage. Yeah. Every time I went to buy a property, there's multiple offers on it, and um, there's going to be contracts on it today. And I mean, even in 2009, there was always multiple <laughs> offers on everything I wanted to buy. Mm-hmm. It seems like agents are always using that. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh god, here we go. Yeah, and so there's a so I love the transparency from both the buyer and the seller side. Like everybody sees exactly what's going on. So right. people are going to your site to search for properties, making an offer, right? Mm-hmm. right? Yep. And the commission is paid only to the buy side. No, so the buyer would pay five percent. The buyer would pay five percent. Okay. Yeah. Like a traditional sale. So let me ask you, does the listing ever go into the multiple listing service? For it, it, it does. It has to. It, it has, has to be listed. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's, that's part of our agreement. Like, this is where I feel like there's been a couple other auction companies that have tried to break into the retail space. Some have tried to cut out realtors. Some have done a poor job of, of kind of breaking in. Like, this has to be a partnership with the real estate community. And so buyer's agents have to be compensated. Selling agents have to be compensated. Mm -hmm. This has to be a win-win for all sides. Yeah, and for those watching, if you hear the buyer pays, it's like, oh, I don't like that because the buyer's paying for everything. The reality is, is even if you do it the old way, the buyer's still paying for (laughs) everything. Because at the end of the day, the buyer's giving the price of the property, and all the proceeds from that price are paying everybody off. It's just the seller signing the check. But the buyer's you know, you're, when you buy the property, you're paying for all the seller's expenses as well as the seller's profit, as well as the seller's liens. Well, so I mean, you're always paying if you're the buyer. Right. I like the platform, right? Because I think it's pretty innovative. If you think about it, I like the transparency as far as what you're saying, putting it on the system where people can track where the bidding is. Um, I do like the fact that, you know, buyers can go directly to the site and it is, in fact, going to also live in the multiple listing service. So just so you know, when a listing goes into the multiple listing service, it's syndicated to the third party websites, be be it, you know, Zillow, Redfin or what have you. And then they can actually go to your website and they can manage all the all the offers offers. and contracts. Mm -hmm. And then um, there is an MLS fee when you put something in the MLS. So will the seller incur an MLS fee along, and then no fees through your company? Well, usually, usually that the buyer would just absorb that as it's well. It's all absorbed. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. So not yeah. that we like to disclose commissions, right? Because we can't say it's a five percent on average, whatever. Right. That's illegal. Uh, but what would you say would be like the commission on, yeah, on it's traditional, uh, whatever the average is? Okay. It's always the same. You know, that's what we do. Okay. I, I would I would list this the same I would any other property. 
And of course, I mean, as the listing agent, I always like to say my marketing fee is not part of the paradigm of, you know, what you're going to net and what a buyer is really willing to pay for your property. It's based on demand. Um, So it's never a part of the conversation. I mean, whatever the market's going to yield is what the market's going to yield based on recent sales. But in this case, you're telling me that, you know, a a buyer needs to just understand the fact that they're going to pay whatever the property is worth, but they're also going to pay a premium to be able to acquire the asset through your program or through your system. Basically. Okay. And one of the things that I have to combat, like I have to coach agents on, is this isn't, like I never coach them to take a $300,000 listing and then add a buyer's premium because then it's an overpriced property and it's not going to sell. By 5% at least. Right. Like the key is to take that market value, reduce the price, drive the traffic, and that's the way that we bid it up. So yeah. there's a big education because this is new. This isn't the way that real estate's been done. Right. But I mean, I think that we're primed for a change and that's why there's $5 billion a year being invested on the tech side of our of our industry. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I like it because it's not one of those platforms where you're saying for sell by owners, right? For sell by owners, always trying to go around the professional. But this is a case where you're saying there is going to be a fee associated with it. But the professional is going to say you have to put, you know, there's also list price, sales price ratio. So you have to put a negotiating uh, you know, percentage on top of right. that list price right. for marketing purposes. And now you're saying that as a listing agent, you also have to include, right? the price for it to sell or to live on your platform. So if I'm buying something on this, on the auction, <clears throat> before I bid someone to call and start asking some more questions, mm-hmm. not just firing away online and just bidding. Like, is there someone I can contact yeah. if I so, do have some more so questions? that's the good thing. So, like, as a listing broker, okay. I still act as a traditional listing broker. Um, yeah, all the questions could funnel to me. I could respond. Yeah, the no. agent's yeah. information is sitting there. It's still there. It's, it's all not just like this, like an there. auction yeah. site. It's not it's a foreclosure auction. That's okay. no. yeah. yeah, that's what I'm mm-hmm. getting at. And that's that's the important thing about technology. I think too many people, um, the technology is great because it gives consumers a little bit more access to see things instead of waiting on a good or a bad agent to deliver the properties to them. Mm-hmm. And what if an agent's just not even good at searching properties? Sure. You kind of got screwed by picking the wrong <laughs> agent. You didn't right. see every house available in the market that you right. really want to look at. So the technology is good in that aspect. But sometimes my advice to people that are online looking at anything, whether it's an auction site or just the regular real estate offices, listings, or whatever it is, pick up the phone and call somebody and ask some questions as well. Yeah. Because they make too many temperamental yeah. decisions not even knowing what they're talking about. I'll give you an example. I saw a listing on an agent's website, uh, social media account the other day. Beautiful house is like six hundred thousand dollars, and everyone's raving about how beautiful this house is. And this other girl jumps in. I just scrolling through her comments, just seeing how everyone is kind of going bananas over this thing and can't wait to go see the open house, right? Then some girl just jumps in and says, "Oh, it's on. It, there's a bunch of three hundred thousand dollar houses. This is way overpriced around it." And it's like it didn't take a genius to see. Well, this one's like double the square footage. Sure. So you can't make that, kind of, and that's just a very green assessment. You go online, you do some basic research, and you think you know it all. Pick up the phone call right. the listing agent as well. All right, guys. Larry, Tony. Why are you th- kicking us th- out? Thank you guys for coming I'm in. I'm leaving, too. If Larry's Where can you find all Larry, this information? Yeah, you, you, could, can plug you, could, you could go to my website, parkviewrealty.com, P-A-R-K-V-U-E, Realty. French. The U. Um, the U. E. Yeah. <laughs> like Cuvée. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Larry. <laughs> you could also go to uh, zome.com. That's X O M E.com. Or you can follow me on uh, in any social media channel at Larry M. F. White. Thank you guys for coming on Market Overdrive. Larry and we're going to keep it moving here with our <laughs> next guest. I remember guest. that one, bro. I mean, Thanks, one of the cool Larry. things about this platform and actually being able to share this information with you guys, we're bringing you information as it becomes available, new platforms. I mean, Nick, if you think about it, what I really like about this zone.com is the fact that it's not just a discount brokerage that's going to give you discount brokerage type of service. Mm-hmm. It's actually just a platform to make it, the, the transaction more transparent, don't you think? I mean, yeah, I think people like that. And, and I think that, look, for us in the industry, it's a little weird to hear that platform because we have to, we're so used to doing the fees a certain way. And then when you actually hear Larry explain it, it makes logical sense. It's just, like I said, reverse engineered. Okay, well, the fees are always there. Right. It's not like you ever get away from the fees from one place or another. People have to do their job and get paid. But you understand it. Yeah, it's, it's more transparent. And I think that some consumers that are brand new and green and have never been in the market to buy a house, they'll understand that better than 
Yeah. The traditional way. And I actually think it's really timely because, as we said, it, as the market is correcting or adjusting <coughs> or what have you, as sellers starting to see that, you know, the pricing Let's is say leveling off. Leveling off. Leveling okay, whatever off. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's but, you know, more, sellers are going to start thinking, like, oh, we, what happened to my value? I mean, last year I could sell it for 10%, 20% more, and now you're telling me it's only a 5% increase, right? So this is another way for them to save money and actually sell the property the property yeah it's still gonna appraise out right it still has to be fair market value but at this point you're not hiring a discount brokerage that's not gonna re- not gonna be responsive it's not gonna negotiate you know on your behalf it's just gonna list it and trying to get um, buyer leads off that listing and I just have you know issues with certain companies but so I got a question what how much time we got left in the show according to Graco <laughs> who's running time, time here I'm we're making time the keeper. timekeeper well, who, why who gave you the stopwatch why? first of all, <laughs> first of all First of all, I oh, run the stopwatch. You've been here once in the last four months. But on a lot and more a shows than you have over the last four okay, years. Okay, enough, platform. because this is what we have and to deal with do, all the time. How much time do I got left? On the second. You're wasting how my airtime by fighting. How much time, time do we have left as a show? We have this is enough ridiculous. time with our next guest. Grago, can you please introduce <clears throat> our next guest? Please? I don't because know. I think he's trying know? to delay the introduction because this guy's actually really good looking. Grago <laughs> likes to have that good looking. I, like, I actually saw him fans. out. I saw him out. He's I've like, he's going to steal all my I've fans. I've this guy down for a lot of years. I've known this gentleman here for the last 20 plus years. No, you haven't. Nick knows him really well, too. from Longer than you. Okay. So how do you know him from 20 if I only know him from 18? I feel like this is, is a fraternity. It? Like, grow up, you guys. I think your years are wrong, though. Who cares? <laughs> His real name is Peter, but I like to call him Hollywood. Look at that smile. Come on, man. Hollywood, give him that smile. Look at that smile. Some things How come you guys are going to introduce Tony like that? I'm, Make you sure know you what? Speak speaking up, of <laughs> Peter Tony DeGur- Club here. Peter DeJurich is here on behalf of? You Pro want credit. What's that? Pro credit. Pro okay. credit. Okay. Pro credit repair. Pro credit repair. repair. Look at that Hollywood smile, man. Guys, don't, don't, don't blush. Don't, you can do what you got to do. Guys, uh, Throw hey the teeth Peter. out there. Some things never change. Huh? No. You guys no. go through the same tricks. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, we have worked with Peter um, starting back in 2001. Peter, you have a lot of experience outside of credit. Man, I'm going to give his resume because I know it myself so well. Why don't you just speak he for him? He not only is a skilled credit repair, he's one of the first people I knew when the whole boom happened, the bust happened, to really dive into that um, market. I don't want to call it credit repair. There's a professional way of saying it. You do it. What is it called? Credit counsel? Credit? I don't know. I mean, it's, I guess it's credit repair, man. Okay. Oh, wait, do we have another Grocco? I don't know. I don't know. It's you, can, like you can talk into the mic, man. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know what's going to come out of Nick's mouth. Any minute. So any minute. Any second. It's professional. And I'm, it's professional. I'm, uneasy. I'm a little uneasy, but. Well, how about this? You give us your resume, yeah. and I'll delve into that. Because right. well, that's what we let our, our guests Tell do. us a little bit about your company. Tell us a little bit about yourself so, and your history. Yeah, as Nick said, I've known him for, gosh, what, about 18 years? Yeah, 18, 19 yeah. years. So I walked into Nick's office. Uh, he had a mortgage company. He was a young guy. Is doing well, and uh, your life, not my life. Tell us about your life, <laughs> your <laughs> career. No, so I walked in. I started in the mortgage industry in '01, mm-hmm. and then it wasn't that long after I actually started working as a real estate agent as well. So I was actually doing mortgages and real estate. How can I compete with that face, though? You can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> so get off. Um, <laughs> Keep going. So did that for did that for a couple of years. Kind of learned that. Managed uh, handle some transactions. Both sides, you know, saw every aspect of it. Whether you're listing, buying, and also on the loan end. And then I uh, went out and opened up my own mortgage broker shop. Yeah. What? Competition yeah, for Nick and <laughs> Carla. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was a good story. We, we won't get into that one right now. Okay. But go ahead. But we, go left, on. we left on good terms. We left on good terms. Which is rare, I think, mm-hmm. in that day, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I feel like this is like a no, and then, divorce uh, so session, like a therapy session. Gentlemen, please get on with your story. We'll hash it out. Like we'll hash it out after the show. Um, in the back. And then, uh, obviously, you know, did that for a couple of years, and obviously the market crashed. Mm-hmm. Um, we got wiped out, and that's when actually I needed credit, and that was actually what kind of brought me into that industry, when I realized that, you know, s- s- the smallest little thing can actually stop you from getting somewhere where you really need to go. And for a lot of times, uh, you know, we step in and deal with people in a situation where they're not able to get approved for a loan, and when they're done with us, they're able to get approved for a loan. Yeah. Um, that's one of the differences. The other difference is there's a substantial savings where they can qualify, but they, can't, they don't qualify for the best loan program. There's too many hits, whether it's a PMI or to whatever. Uh, if, you, you know, if they get a little extra 20 or 30 or 40 points on the report. You know, changes the rate. Changes everything. Saves them mm-hmm. a lot of money. So. I mean, this is great information, right? Because I think that when people go through mm-hmm. a low 
experience in their lives that we all have, right? It's life. Um, you get to learn something, but I love the fact that you're using this information to help other people. So I recently posted, I'm actually going to be traveling to uh, Memphis to, again, support St. Jude. So thank you for the opportunity. But I, I believe that, you know, a life of service is worth living. Um, and I appreciate what you're doing because I do get a lot of buyers who would love to be property owners, who would love to not rent but they have either low credit scores or they just don't have the down payment. And the low credit score really affects how much property you can buy or whether you can even buy something. So can you tell us how does somebody get started if they do have you know, issues with their credits? Um, well, the first, first place you start is actually pulling your reports. And by law, uh, you can actually, everybody has the right to pull a copy, a free copy of their reports once a year directives from the bureaus, that's called, uh, you go to annualcreditreport.com. What it gives you is a report directly from each bureau with all the information. You get to kind of check things there. What it does not give you is your actual credit scores. And hopefully we'll touch a little bit later on credit scores because I think there's, that's one of the biggest things that we run into. Um, so you can get copies of your reports. You pull those reports, take a look at what's on there. And what you're looking for is, uh, you know, what, what do you have that's negative? It's going to list all the negative information. And that's essentially uh, what's helpful in figuring out um, whether you have things to deal with. A lot of times people, the biggest issues we run into that we see is uh, when people move, you have a lot of moving parts, right? Scheduling it's the movers. Nightmare. I just moved. It everything. Sucks. And from the utilities to Comcast to returning Every the equipment to your, dress, to your dish, your direct TV or Fre any of that stuff. I learned this one today. My frequent flyer card, I couldn't get through because of security because I kept giving the wrong address. Just your like rewards card. It's crazy. Like, dumb sh stuff. How is that relevant <laughs> to credit? I don't know. You everything you 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 you'll no. lose a bill. No, you what I'm saying. Yeah. If you forget a bill, the last bill is a common thing that you see. Whether Just it's you equipment return. To pay all your bills doesn't mean that. No, this has you to might do have had a forget. leftover bill from a hospital that had your old address on or, there, and it was like. Something the insurance didn't cover, and here it is in your collection. Well, let me go back to what you said about pulling your credit report. And you said we can get free credit reports. We can yeah. pull those once a year. Annualcreditreport.com, you get the pull. But is free. that like from the three bureaus? Yeah, it's directly. What you're looking to get a FICO? And can you please explain what is a FICO? God, it's great questions. Um, you get copies of your report for free directly from each bureau in each bureau's format. You don't get a score. So the credit score thing is one of the biggest misconceptions or just overall people are misinformed. The general thinking is that there's one credit score. And a lot of millennials, there's some survey that came out from Discover that said everybody, a lot of millennials think that everyone starts off with a perfect credit score, and that's not true. But I'm sure you guys have seen situations where people will come in and say, well, I went to Credit Karma said I was a 720, and you guys pull them, and it's like a 620. Well, the difference in that is um, there's one version. There's 50 different versions of FICO. And there's probably three or four that are primarily used in all of lending, whether it's auto loans, uh, credit card loans, mortgage. And those are the three main things. There's three different versions of that score. What they don't give you is they don't freely give that to you out. As a consumer, you cannot get a mortgage FICO score for free. There's only one place where you can get a consumer to direct. That's MyFICO, M-Y-F-I-C-O.com. Okay. They're going to give you all the different versions of the credit scores. Um, and let's not kid ourselves, right? I mean, credit is not relevant just to people who are looking to buy or apply for a loan. If you're renting a property and you have low credit, it means that you're going to either pay six months of prepaid rents or you're going to pay a... Um, they pull your credit to sign up the electric bill now. Mm -hmm. well, like, true, comment, right? run but your I'm credit. But I'm saying, like, housing is important. You can always, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a small bill to pay 160 or $50 a month for utilities or maybe your cell phone. But when it comes to getting housing and applying for a rental property, even our millennials, right, who can't afford to buy right now because they don't have the income to justify or debt to income mm. ratios to justify a purchase but just something as simple as getting your own apartment if you have a low credit score i mean there's nowhere to start you're going to be paying more right so what i want to know since you're a guru on credit what place do you like to use or do you recommend because people need to monitor this more frequently i think that a lot of people like they check it and then they haven't checked it in the year and they don't realize what's going on, and then they're su surprised when they go to buy something large like a car or a mortgage, and they're like, "I had a 750 last time I checked it. Why do I have a 610?" Yeah, it's actually a great, so, and that's a great thing. Monitoring is important, in my opinion. Yeah, and there's a lot of different places you can monitor. You can get credit monitoring. Um, monitoring is one one thing that I think everybody should do, no matter what, regardless of your score, because it's going to let you know whether somebody tries to use your identity or whether you have anything negative Someone ran come your credit up. Report. 
Yeah, whether somebody ran it or like a lot of times uh, a common thing we see is people that have credit cards that they don't use that often. Uh, they're idle cards, but they have an annual fee and they're not used to getting statements and that fee gets charged. The next thing you know, you get hit 30 days late on your credit. Yep. Um, things like that are a big problem. But for as far as monitoring, um, there's a lot of different companies that can do serve the same function, which is giving you awareness as to whether or not you have anything negative coming up or whether somebody's trying to use your identity. What do you like? Creditchecktotal.com is a good one. That's my favorite. Um, I would probably recommend my FICO because only, and the primary reason is because Credit Check Total gives you a version of FICO, but credit my FICO is actually going to give you the version of FICO that that's going to be important to you if you're wanting to get into real estate. Oh wow! So that's the biggest thing. Like <clears throat> all those other websites, a big a lot of people come in thinking that they know what their credit scores are, but when it comes in for mortgage transactions, it's a very specific formula. Now, is it me or am I wrong? But does auto loans seem like the highest one? Every time I've gone to like, I know I usually know my credit report because let's face it, sometimes I just run it at work. It's low. You know, it's like eh. Let me run it. It's <laughs> it's at least two hundred points. It's, 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 it's two hundred no. points higher than yours, that's for sure. Um, so really whatever it is, that. it's two hundred points higher than yours. Never. Um, my credit score is like my height. Do over you here. actually want to pull? Different. Can we pull our credit report? So, yeah, I'll do it. Let's let's, let's do, do it. it. Let's do it. You, you set yourself up. Wait, for this listen. One? Let's I, do it. Oh, are you kidding me right now? I am so proud of my really? credit score. Really? Right. She finally got sixes. So here's my question: Is it normally higher? Because I'll run my report at work. I like challenges. I think I know your answer. I'll run my report at work. I think I know why. And then you walk into a car dealership. And you're like thinking, oh, I got like a 750 credit score. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, you got an eight. And you're like, yeah. what? I just ran it yesterday. Well, it's going to be specific for everybody. But I think in your situation, they're, the algorithms are calibrated so they're transaction specific. So if somebody bought a lot of cars and had a lot of payment histories in the past. Oh, uh, so yeah. like a thousand. Right. Yeah. That, that's actually. <laughs> oh that's How does actually, it always go back to you and your decadent man. lifestyle? That's one Let's of the reasons. Let's bring it back to real estate, though. A lot of people have this concern. And you guys are lenders, so you probably heard this before and yeah. probably heard it on our show, but I want to get the expert advice on this. So if somebody goes from a lender A to lender B and get their credit pulled, this, how does that affect their credit? That's a great question. Um, that how how I've line, understood it? it. Yeah, how I mean, I've. Can you please let the expert answer the question, gents? Nick's, Nick's nervous. No, I just want to make sure that that changed in 09 because that's what I heard. I think it's uh, what you're supposed to do. What I've, the way I've always understood it, now I'm not a lawyer, don't quote me on it, but I think uh, the system used to punish you anytime you pull your credit because they think you're distressed and you're seeking debt. And now what they realize is that in the normal behavior of somebody going for a mortgage process, it's normal to shop and they shouldn't ding somebody to shop. So... What, how I've understood it is uh, it's a certain allotted time period if it's the same type of inquiry because it tracks what kind of an inquiry. So if you have four mortgage inquiries, if you do them all inside of a 30-day window, they're they are supposed to get treated as one and are not supposed to have an impact on the score. Which makes sense. That's how, we're, that's how I've understood because, it. That's a, and, and some of it came at me via news, <clears throat> like watching TV just it popped up that they were making adjustments and some of it through reading because – I when the in, crash happened, in 08, 09, yeah, yeah, they, they switched the They, they the said subversion. it was unfair because consumers needed, they didn't have a right to shop because everybody yeah. would put the fear of God in them. Okay, you just ran your credit with me. Don't go running it elsewhere because mm -hmm. they <laughs> trapped a client yeah. and they would have to stick with that rate or those fees or whatever. But a client wanted to know if someone was cheaper. No yeah. one gives you a quote until they actually see it because they don't know what they're dealing with. Yeah. I well, can't was, tell you your rate until I see your credit report. The big question here is where is credit going? Because there are some big changes coming. I want you to touch question. on that as far as yeah, that's a great yeah and who shot Kennedy? System. That's the other one after there's that. There's a new system coming. Um, yeah, so what, what's happening now is uh, there actually there's a new law that was passed. They're, they're reviewing uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Have, they've been instructed to evaluate, to come up with criteria to entertain the possibility of actually having the ability to use two different credit scores in the mortgage process. And I think that's going to take up to about two years. They're evaluating that. They're going to have to come up with a criteria. Uh, FICO has 90% of the marketplace in lending, so yeah. they're, they're, they have a mon monopoly. Uh, the credit bureaus, TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax came up with their own credit score. It's called a Vantage score. That's the score that they give out on Credit Karma. They're aggressively pushing to get that score to give FICO some competition uh, so there is an alternative because the thinking behind it is that FICO, the version of FICO that they're using right now is impl has been implemented or created in 2004, a lot of inefficiencies and what they're what they don't like about it is they think there's about 20 million or so people that normally would be able to be scored and get approved and as an eligible person that you put you know mm -hmm. put into a pool of buyers that FICO with the system now they're not able to get approved 
So the, 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 what they're thinking is that this system is you know, unfairly treating 20 million people, and that 20 million people is going to help the real estate market. What are your thoughts on that, Nick? I mean, you're seeing this, and you're underwriting, well, not underwriting, but... I honestly just hate credit scores, period. I, I still believe, I mean, I get it. The, the scoring system is, is the playing field that we're all on today, but I come from, you know, I started in the 90s with mortgages, and, and I would like to just look at credit, Versus worrying about a score because I think you could really tell the story. Right. I've always given the classic example. I had a doctor who had million dollar property, million dollar loan, I should say, multiple nice cars on his credit report, and then his credit score was five eighty. He came in to refinance his jumbo loan, and he's like, "Well, I'm looking for this rate." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's great." And I ran his credit report, thinking this shouldn't be a problem, because um, he was, seemed like a very meticulous person. But then I ran it; it was like a five eighty credit score. I don't have the rate for him anymore, but because of FICO. And all it was was his daughter had a BB card for like 180 bucks and just like never paid it. And it was oh, attached wow. to his name. He had no idea. She was hiding the bill because she was embarrassed that she spent it. It was just some story. Now, if I look at this guy's history and see like, you know, $6,000 mortgage payment, multiple $1,500 car payments, I know that the BB is clearly an error. Just give him the rate he wants. But no. That's that's where I have my problems with FICO, to be honest with you. I, I believe that if there was some kind of a system where we could look at credit – a little bit more. Uh, the activity and transaction. Yeah, the like, well, payments, you know, is this guy going to default on his mortgage? I, I feel like if you've had late on credit cards, there should be a certain hit for that or a small collection or a parking ticket, a certain minor hit for that. But then mortgage hits and car payments should take the biggest hits. And we're I, destroying people on like one little thing sometimes. I think it'll all be a thing of the past inside of 10 years. I think you're probably not going to see credit bureaus anymore. There, oh. There's a new. Cool. They're going to redo the whole system. Blockchain technology is coming in, and some of the people, what they're doing is they're going to have a decentralized system where information can be exchanged. And aside of that initiative, that's a little bit longer down the right, down the road. But prior to that, right now, there's a new FICO initiative where, uh, actually touching exactly what you're saying, somebody who's got a BB card, they want a little bit more information. As you know, FICO or any credit report literally is just the liability side mm -hmm. and your payment behavior on it. That's right. all it shows. Now they're they want to bring in a they've got a new score in this new system. I don't know if it's going to be used for mortgages, but for people that aren't scored or negatively scored, they they want to link up your bank account information and your deposits, your balances, and how much money, and NSFs and all that have, stuff have everything they can factored see, like, in. So they're seeing if someone's checks. got if someone's got bad credit, but he's got a ton of money in the bank. Well, then that's not really that big of a risk. So right, it's all the, the name of the game well. is risk, right? Yeah, that's another thing that's really sad. You have people that are just using credit because they want to. You know, somebody has a million dollars in cash in the bank, and they want to go have a mortgage for four hundred grand. We make fun of athletes all the time and celebrities because why would you mortgage? You made eighty million dollars last year. That's a two million dollar house. They do that for. I mean, I'm not an accountant, but there's reasons that they're mortgaging things at times. Tax and so, you know, if a guy's got a couple million dollars in the bank and he's looking to borrow two hundred thousand, who cares that he's got a five eighty? He could pay it off with one scratch of a check. I don't think we should penalize him or give him a worse rate if there was a way to do that. Yeah, I think it's all. I mean, I think those changes are on the horizon just down the road. Well, great information. Thank you so much for using our platform to share this information. Quick question, though. Um, how long does it take for someone to repair credit? So that's actually an awesome question. Um, it really is case oh, by on, case. So how long does it take someone to repair credit? You know what? <laughs> I just want to ask an awesome question. I think I just got <laughs> asked that. <laughs> oh can my cut, god can, I can really need to get that? on the road no, and not deal with that's you a legit today. question I don't know how you guys deal with him I cannot I, I can't cope that's it. why it's good that it's only like no, it, not every day yeah it varies I mean you've got a multitude of different situations so every situation what we do is uh, you know when someone reaches out they, they typically come with us from a, from a loan officer and they, they we know what their score is we know where they need to go um, what they're looking to do is uh Oftentimes, short-term goals. No, so short-term, we're able to step in in a lot of situations. We just, when we do an assessment, we can figure out very quickly if it's a type of file that we can move typically in less than 30 days. We get to step in and out. We, you, we get pretty aggressive with our strategies, and we know what tactics are going to work with certain negatives. Um, so a lot of stuff that we deal with, we're done in less than 30 days. Um, so, some situations, no matter what you do, it's going to be a three, four, five, or six-month process. Um, but we specialize specifically in getting in and out typically in less than 30 days with situations. And we typically tie our feet to performance and on okay. the back end where uh, we you have to hit the certain threshold of the FICO score in order to earn the remainder of our fee. Mm. Okay. And that's typically how we structure it. Uh, but it's all case by case. We just have to assess it. Our niche really is, is being able to look at a lender report mm -hmm. and identifying whether or not we can get the score where they need it to go and how quickly and what it would cost. And now some that. people, we've referred clients, uh, or I have no loan officers that have referred clients to Peter 
plenty. Nick, and, I and, mean, Rocco does, right? And Rocco, there's you guys been, work together a lot. There's been uh, loan officers that I know that use other services. Tell the difference because there's some services that just use like this computer generated credit. It's yeah, it's, system, it's scale. Which it's so, really so it's all scale. So you typi- guys get a little grimy. You guys like actually do work. Yeah, this is a more customized boutique approach. We're not scaled to do service a lot of people. Is it custom well, like your suit. Very okay, like cool. your hair. All right, just making sure. <laughs> um, Can I please get no, rid of you? <laughs> like, no, but to talk you to know. Bob. Can we please WGN? Who bespoke credit. To? That's what you should have called it. Cope with you. Let him talk. I think his, his nicotine gum is kicking in. <laughs> um, no, uh, what you have is, you know, when they're scaled, there's a, the, 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 the subscription model is the preferred model because for that same reason, you can scale it. So people pay monthly. They're incentivized to keep them in the system as long as possible. And they pay monthly and they can service 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 clients a month. I where we do, yeah. we do less than a We do less than 100. Okay. Um, but we, we're a customized approach and, you know, obviously focused on results. And typically, um, and speed. we want them in and out. Yeah, so we want them in and, in and out in less than 30 days. So, I love that. Well, I like to leverage all of Nick's friends, and you're Grokko's fan, so we're like family now. So Ugh. can I get like a freebie, maybe two secrets of like what can somebody do to improve their credit? Just two secrets? Yeah, yeah start yeah. paying free? bills <laughs> sure. time, Carla. Can you please let him speak? Go ahead. He's, he's nervous. Very. And he's wearing you white. You make him nervous. He's wearing he's white. Because he's not wearing a suit. He's, he's white. He's wearing a white shirt and he's not tan. <laughs> he's not tan. Yeah, so <laughs> not. it comes off. You Peter, can't see Peter, his beautiful eyes. Bright. Where can we find you, bro? Where, where can uh, you where's my two Grocco's secrets? Grocco Why are you doing that? Show. Bro, you don't run shit around we're here. We're over. Just so minutes. you know that. We're way over. <laughs> way over. <laughs> we're way over. You're like third in the pecking order, and that's behind two and of me. All right. Then you're. Yeah, because you are kind of big right now. I like don't. Nick, can I give the number? I quit. Like Can I give the number? Um, you can give your number, email I didn't even address, get coffee today. home address, the whole sure. nine yards. Phone number is 312-423-6700. Again, 312-423-6700. Your website? Website is pro-creditrepair.com. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the information, then I'm going to send it to you guys. So inbox me, and I'll make sure to give you the two secrets on how to fix your credit fast without having to pay a fee. But of course, if you want that customized service, you can always reach out to Hadi Patati over there. Uh, make sure he helps you out with clear fixing your credit. Do you like that? Hollywood. I never call you wow. Hadi Patati. You're just jelly. All right. Good stuff. <laughs> can we do a little Don't we promo? have some events we that you got to tell? We got a few events coming up here, guys. Um, Zach, you're in my shot. <laughs> Attaboy. What is wrong with him? <laughs> is he like in control of everything today? That's your There's fault. Grocco. You have manifested uh, that monster. He's so, a celebrity, though. Uh-huh. So, yeah, Look how you, cute you, he you looks. You made me a celebrity, Carla. Look at that outfit. So Carla and I and Nick, the Mod Squad, we're going to be at the Fremont uh, Wednesday, November 7th for uh, an amazing event, real estate event. Come out, join us. Red in Chicago is going to be in town. There's anticipating over 500 attendees. Uh, so make sure you join us. Uh, we'll be there right around 6 p.m. So we're looking forward to that. Also, we have Tony P. in the house somewhere here behind me. Um, Hi, gentlemen. Forgive me, guys. Tony P.'s networking event is Tuesday, November 13th. Please make sure you guys come out for that. It's going to be at Rocket in River North. So looking forward to seeing everybody out. Listen, it's cold outside. There's not a lot of things to do, but if you want to expand your network and get to meet a lot of professionals, successful professionals that are changing the platform and the industry in Chicago, come out to these events and support. Uh, Lots of good stuff. I am really excited uh, that we're going to actually be interviewing. So if you'd like to come on our show and uh, be a part of the Mod Squad, we're going to be at the Red in Chai event. Mm -hmm. Um, So make sure to stop by and say hello to us. And there's a lot of events that we are going to be covering here. And of course, shout out to all my friends who donated through St. Jude. Remember, Mm. we care about the kids. So continue to make those donations. Nick? Woo-wee. I'll do the close out <laughs> since Grocco, uh, oh, I thought Grocco was going to do the close out there. I still get oh, paid to do should, the close right? You might as well you do know, it, man. Do well I get paid to do the close out? He, yes. <laughs> Please close out. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's close this thing out. We wait. will be back. What Thursday? Wait, wait. What? Do we have permission to close out? Yes. Yeah, is it now. okay? Is, is the okay? time good? Mr. Yeah, Nico's Funes? in my Mr. In my phone He says three words and then tells us when we can and can't talk. Hi, I'm Dolly. Hi, Dale. All right. That's it. That's a wrap. We'll be back not next Thursday, but the following Thursday, I believe. Does that yeah. sound about right? All right. I like that. The following Thursday, which is the 15th. Thursday the 15th. That's we'll be back on air at 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. For this show and all the other shows, you can go to our catalog, which is located on Facebook forward slash Market Overdrive. Of course, we are on our YouTube channel, and you subscribe to the WGM family. 
with your iPhone or iOS or whatever, you can go to uh, iTunes and subscribe to our podcast there as well as our website, which is new and improved and looks all fancy, marketoverdrive.com. That's it. Thank you for watching another episode of Market Overdrive. If you like the information, please make sure to double S, share, and subscribe, and also like, right? Yeah, make sure you follow us on marketoverdrive.com and all of our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We'll see you soon. Yeah.